Hello, everybody. Byron here. Welcome to another episode of Who the Hell Asked. Uh, and I'm hearing better audio quality for once. Alongside Slade. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going, everybody? And yeah, Byron, you sound a lot better than you usually do. This is great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, gaming news. Uh, holy shit. <laughs> Yeah, so we were going to do another uh, predictions video. This was really going to be more towards, you know, all the other companies involved with E3 and whatnot. But, but uh, let's just say a certain other summer video game announcing event has decided they're going to throw a wrench into everyone's plants. And I absolutely love it. This is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but first, something that's not monkey wrenching. PlayStation controllers. New yeah, PlayStation so controllers. Yeah, so these were announced last week. We didn't have the chance to cover these because we were doing our predictions. But uh, the new DualSense controllers got new colors. Yep. And they're going to hit the shelves coming up here in June. Yep. So Mid uh, yep. Midnight, you have... Midnight Black and Cosmic Red. Yeah, so the classic good old black for uh, PlayStation. Yep, should should have been, should have been the launch color red. IMO, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, th this was kind of random to see. We, it, I knew at some point we were gonna get new colors, but a yeah, little quicker than I thought. So, what do you think of these colors, Slade? Um, outside of you know just the classic PlayStation controller, everyone knows and love. I think the midnight red one looks all right. I probably personally wouldn't get it, but uh. Yeah, it looks all right. Yeah, like they could put like a Spider-Man logo on the touchpad. Yeah, you know what? Bit... That's actually the first thing I thought of was Spider-Man <laughs> when I saw it. So yeah. yeah, like make it a bit of a darker, more like Spider-Man-y red. Put the white lo web logo. Bam, no, no, no. What they could do is they make the red texture of the controller kind of like match the uh, suit itself with like the lines to like make it look like webbing and stuff like that. Ooh, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. But uh, uh, overall, it's have... pretty cool that they have the new controllers and the classic PlayStation controller colors but back. I, I, wa I want to say something. And I, I've th this has been my opinion since the DualSense first was revealed June of last year. I th Why did Sony remove the coloring from the buttons that's a playstation standard yeah that actually you know what i've never noticed that until just now really that is how? a pretty strange how? decision how did you i don't know i just i don't have a ps5 probably because the scalpers all have them what? um <laughs> and uh, i just haven't really been looking too intently at the controls yeah that is crazy where are the colors on those ones uh, wow they, that don't, is they don't exist they don't exist slate that's the thing they don't exist and the and like this black is making me realize this should have had the color buttons. If, uh, excuse me, if only for the black variant. But uh, yeah, now that we have these, I bet you we're gonna get a all black PS5 at some point very soon. Yeah, honestly, with this and that, I'm surprised that wasn't already a thing. But well, it's well. I kind of see why it isn't right now, Slade, because obviously, yeah, because obviously, shortages. The, yeah, so they're just making whatever PS5s they can yeah, make it's right now. To make a controller, and in even these. if they made one with like a new color, like the scalpers are just going to get them all anyway. So <laughs> they're going to get them all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah. on to our next bit of news, and also kind of a prediction crusher for uh, poor Byron here. Okay, uh, Mario Golf Super Rush got a uh, kind of overview trailer, not too dissimilar to like a game specific direct. Yes. So my prediction was that at the end of either the end of this month or like the very beginning of June, there would be a Mario Golf. Super Rush over uh, direct, basically, kind of like what happened with Mario Tennis Aces a couple of years ago. Well, we got an overview trailer, and we got some uh, we got some new characters. <laughs> oh yeah, so uh, they explained a lot of the core gameplay and mechanics. They, in particular, that free run mode that we got excited for when we first saw it. Oh yeah, was uh, showed off quite a bit, and uh, honestly, it looks very fun and fantastic. I did not think I'd be excited for a Mario Golf game, but here we are. 
Yeah, so, like like uh, I was gonna be excited regardless, but Byron, I'm gonna say your prediction's still fifty percent on like it's not a direct technically. Yeah, but it's not. It's not. I feel like this video is similar enough to one. Yeah, I, to I where, guess. Where like yeah, they they they, they shared a it's what fifteen seventeen minutes long or something like that. Oh uh, no, this is five minutes. <laughs> that was five minutes. Okay, I'm going crazy. Yeah, you're, I you're think going it, this is close enough. I think this is close enough. I give you like a fifty percent. Yeah, but uh, we got the, three like, new prediction. characters. Uh, some of them ha- were already revealed prior, but the three newcomers we have are Pauline, who has started to be in everything as, like, the new, like, oh, from mainline Mario character in the game. And then we have King bob and Charge and Chuck. Yeah, so uh, I'm noticing a trend here with the uh, Mario spinoffs in particular. This isn't even just affecting Mario. It's also affecting anything else Mario's involved in, where they kind of just rotate which generic enemy that they put in these uh, Mario setups. For example, Super Mario Party had Goomba and uh, what Mon- else, Byron? Monty Mole. Yeah, and Monty Mole. Yeah, uh, Monty Mario Mole. Tennis Aces had uh, Chain Chomp. And even Smash Brothers has kind of been affected by this to an extent, which had Piranha Plant. So... Yeah, it did have Piranha Plant, yeah. <laughs> So it just kind of seems to be the uh, targeting strategy. Maybe they just make an interesting and unique character that hasn't really been in the other Mario spinoffs games. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to add this character and it's going to be something that makes this game stand out. And well, certainly having Charge and Chuck and and King bob playable is definitely going to be a fucking standout for sure. Well, I don't think it's King bob so much because King bob was already playable in uh, Mario Kart Tour. Well, 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 yeah, but for console players. Yeah, I, like, I got King you, Bob-omb I got you. Be new. No, and obviously fucking Charge and Chuck was like the most out of left field possible pick for a golf game of all games. Oh, uh, Pom Pom was who I was thinking of. Oh, yeah, Pom. And uh, Super Mario Party. But anyways, yeah, Charging Chuck was definitely a pretty out there, out there pick. I definitely wasn't expecting it. Uh, it's a, a King of Bomb surprises me a lot less. Mm-hmm. And yeah. obviously, Pauline's kind of been really popular since the release of Super Mario Odyssey. I think that's to no one's surprise yeah, as to well. Absolute, yeah, to the surprise of, of nobody. Pauline's like, quite technically the video game original damsel in distress. So. Yep. Well, Peach kind of came by and took the title, but... <laughs> yep. But, uh... So, something we talked about a little bit uh, before we started recording this. Uh, so, look at the, looking at this current character selection screen, there appears to be eight slots left for other potential characters. Yeah, so, uh, this could mean that there's probably more unlockable characters. Either that... Or the more likely outcome is they're going to be post-game DLC. Yeah, post-game DLC or, like, updates via, like, how it was in Mario Tennis Aces. Maybe. Yes. Maybe. So, definitely stay tuned for that. It's going to be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. I guess looking at this roster of Mario Golf Super Rush, I guess the only disappointment I have is I'd like to see more Donkey Kong characters outside of just Donkey Kong. <laughs> that, like, that, that's I feel that's like outside of expansions, like... we don't see Diddy anymore. We don't see King K. Rule. Well, or well, well Diddy Kong. was just in Super Mario Party, so... Yeah, but he was added to the game after, wasn't he? Uh, no, never mind. I'm wrong. I'm, wrong. I'm also very tired. So, yeah, but I would like to see more Donkey Kong characters and these uh, Mario spinoffs. So I guess that's probably the one thing that disappointed me. But yeah, you know, just... hey, Charging Chuck, King Babom, and Pauling are interesting enough I, characters. I, I'm, I'm, if when I get this game at some point, I probably will be a Charging Chuck slash King Babom main. Honestly, <laughs> uh, I gotta stick with my boy Yoshi. Yoshi uh, for all the Mario spinoffs. Is Yo- Yoshi for life. So we also got a closer look at the stadium mode, where you basically it's the first uh, character to get three holes in this giant free roaming stadium wins. Now, yeah, I saw that, and yeah. it looked like the stadiums had, like, you know, obstacles and 
platforming even a, a little mark? a little bit the problem yeah. i foresee though with this mode is that it doesn't seem like it's procedurally generated or there's not enough random elements it looks like it's just always the same Course. So you think it's going to get stale pretty quickly? Absolutely, I think it's going to get stale really quickly. But who knows? Maybe it is procedurally generated, but maybe they probably would advertise that if uh, if that absolutely was the case. And then, of course, we got some looks at, like, four of the courses. We got your standard grass course, your standard desert course, a kind of, like, swampy, foresty course, and then, of course, we got to look at the Bowser course, which is, of course, a Bowser course. <laughs> like, what else yeah, can I say about, about that? Yeah, what you would it's expect. Like, it's like lava. So, uh, this is looking to be probably the best Mario spinoff since the release of uh, Mario and Rabbit Kingdom Battles, in my opinion. Ooh. So, I think this game has a lot of potential overall. I'm pretty excited for it. Can't wait for it to come out and give it a shot. Yeah. This and game, this uh, game looking forward fun. to all the new game modes they're trying to keep. An yeah, to try to keep mode. everybody going. And uh, they did show a little bit of that single player mode. It, it looks like it's just a tutorial mode. <laughs> so <laughs> don't expect like Mario Golf on like the Game Boys type of uh, RPG levels. <laughs> of... All right, let's talk about our next topic. This one is a bit controversial. Yes. So, uh, Byron, if you want to take this away. I will. Uh, so there was, uh, I believe it was the day after we got the Mario Golf overview trailer, there was an Amiibo announcement for Skyward Sword. A Zelda and Loftwing Amiibo figure. It, it will, of course, launch the same day as the Skyward Sword HD uh, game and the Joy-Cons, which I believe we have covered in a previous episode. I, yeah, we got... Actually, that was covered during the wreck. But yeah, uh, the Zelda Loveling Amiibo uh, features two characters on the single base. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And its functionality caused a little bit of controversy. All right, so let's talk about this. So a lot of people, when they saw the announcement of Skyward Sword HD being revealed to be a full price $60 HD upscaling of a Wii title. There is a lot of initial disappointment by people because it doesn't look like they were making any improvements to the game outside of, you know, the joystick controls, like the non-motion controls and whatnot, which admittedly is work, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's that's like that seems like a godsend from whatever. Yeah, but considering that, you know, the Crash Insane trilogy as well as recently released the Mass Effect Legendary Edition and like a bunch of other things. These mm. HD upscales of older games have not priced at full price games overall. Or at least when they do price them at full price games, they're in a package of multiple games. Yeah. So seeing a, sing a port of a single Wii title for uh, $60 has already kind of had some people very uh, cautious about buying the game. But yeah, then when yeah. you see an improvement made to the game, a quality of life improvement that the game probably sorely desperately needs, if we're being honest, um, locked to Amiibo functionality that you're going to have to pay additional money for outside of buying the game. Yes. So then obviously that's going to make a lot of people upset because they're already paying $60 for an upscaled port that adds pretty much nothing new to the original experience outside of traditional controls for people who want to play with controllers. Mm -hmm. But also, adding this sort of quality of life change that the game desperately needs, and then locking it to a uh, physical paywall is making people very understandably upset, including yes. myself. Yeah. So but was... that's not even the end of the controversy. Well, yeah, but, but before we continue on, Okay, uh, go to ahead. explain the feature, normally you can only return from the surface to the sky by way of designated save points. But using the Zelda and Loftwing Amiibo while on the surface in the game will allow you to return to the skies from anywhere on the surface, even inside dungeons. Now, from what I've heard, dra statues are aplenty in Skyward Sword. 
They are, but it's still a pain in the rear, especially when you're in the middle of something, you're trying to find like a collectible, like a heart piece or something. And then you have nothing else to gather in the area and you still have to spend three or four minutes backtracking to find the statue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously this still is, it's not great that like once, again, once again, a fun ami amiibo functionality has content that should be in the base game locked behind it. I'm looking at you, fucking Metroid amiibo. <laughs> locking yeah. a difficulty. There's probably some so, other amiibos I can't think of that have content locked behind it, but I can't remember them at the moment. <laughs> yeah, like I said, a lot of people are extremely disappointed with the news about this. But if the fact that they're locking amiibo function or a quality of life feature behind an amiibo wasn't already bad enough, they're also charging $25 for this Amiibo, which I think is more than most Amiibo that they sell. Yeah, I, like, I don't believe, get me wrong. I believe so. Yeah, don't get me wrong. The Amiibo looks fantastic. It's great. Probably get, with the Lockling and Zelda herself on there, it's probably got a lot more detail. It's a lot larger than most Amiibo would yeah, be. Yeah, probably so more like resources to, to create this thing. It's understandable that uh, they want this amiibo to sell well, yeah. but uh, ultimately, it's just it's really unfortunate that they're locking behind, you know, something like this quality of life functionality behind an amiibo. Whereas I feel like the thing about amiibo, and I guess DLC in particular, if I'm going to go all in on my views on this. Oh, I don't mind when Amiibo functionality do things like unlock cosmetics or kind of do some nifty but not very necessary to the game experience little thing like, oh, the Gan Amiibo causes the enemies to do like double damage or something in Breath of the Wild or the link, the various like Amiibos kind of give you different outfits. Oh, oh, that's hilarious that that's what the Ganondorf Amiibo does. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah, um... Basically, like all the uh, amiibos for uh, Breath of the Wild, don't you know border on the edge of being absolutely vital to enjoying the game at the core game's experience and whatnot. And those are the kind of amiibos I'm okay with. And you know, day one DLCs when they're entirely cosmetic. What I'm not okay with is when they do something like literal fast travel. That's basically what this is. They lock literal fast travel behind a $25 paywall when it should just be put in the game. I think it's, in practice, very scummy, especially when porting the game as a full-price game is already really scummy. And uh, it's a shame, because I really like Skyward Sword overall. I think it has the best story in the entire Zelda series. Mm -hmm. But yeah. unfortunately, I will not be purchasing this game. So... Really unfortunate, but unless you make your voice heard by voting with your wallet, these things will continue to happen. So, all right, now yeah. moving on to the biggest bombshell announcement of the last week. So, uh, Jeff Keighley came out with a nice little tweet that announced the kickoff of the Summer Games Festival. And let me tell you, there is a lot to unpack there. Ah, uh, yes, there is. So, in Keeley's tweet, he said, the first line of details are here. Welcome to Summer Game Fest 2021. It begins Thursday, June 10th with Kickoff Live, a spectacular world premiere showcase, including a performance by Weezer, streaming everywhere at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. BST. Who? That, yeah, you're right. There is a lot to unpack. So it seems like Summer Games, Summer Game Fest is going to be a event, not multiple events over the span of a couple of months, which is quite the like callback, I guess, if you, if you yeah. want to call it that. <laughs> it seems like Jeff Keighley and, you know, Summer Games Fest is responding to fan criticism that. Last year, the events were too spread out. There was a lot of, like, filler between developer interviews and whatnot, and not enough actual announcements from a lot of these companies. Yeah. 
to feel like it was like an event and it just kind of felt like a bunch of companies were kind of just doing their own thing. Yeah. And a lot of people were really disappointed with that because uh, it was really hard to like keep people's interest over the span of like two or three months. I yeah. think they've obviously learned from this and uh, let's go into the details a little bit about kickoff yeah, live. Yes. Uh, so 2021 partners no i'm not i, I was gonna meme hilariously do it in like the yakko style but no we've got holy shit we have a lot of people 2k activision amazon games annapurna interactive bandai namco blizzard capcom devolver dot emu ea epic finji frontier gearbox high res studios inner sloth koch media media tonic mihoyo PlayStation, Psyonix, Raw Fury, Riot Games, Saber Interactive, Sega, Square Enix, Steam, <laughs> Tencent, Tribeca Festival 2021 presented by AT&T, Ubisoft, Warner Brothers Games, Wizards of the Coast, and Xbox. That's all yeah, so that is quite the lineup overall. You can see some companies like Xbox and Bandai Namco, Capcom, they're kind of two-timing both E3 and uh, the Summer Games Fest. When this list initially came out, our first impressions were, holy shit, they're going right for the jugular. They're going right at E3. And that was, that was your impression. That was your yeah. impression. Guys. Okay, okay. Let's not be so pointed. <laughs> we'll just explain into them. So... Then after seeing a lot of these events that are kind of like, you know, two-timing overall, it just seems like this is going to be a complimentary event to E3, especially because a lot of these events like the Ubisoft Ford and whatnot are being co-streamed by both the Summer Games Fest and E3. Yeah, yeah. So overall, this just seems like the Summer Games Fest is responding to the criticism that the event was spread out. Um, it appears that the uh, kickoff live show is going to be two hours long yep. on June 10th. It's going to be before the first day of E3. And uh, it's going to have a lot of video gaming as well as a uh, musical session right at the start. Yeah. So uh, a lot to look forward to there overall. Um this kind of threw a wrench in our plans for doing predictions for E3 because now that we know that some of these companies like PlayStation and EA and whatnot, which had previously stated they weren't going to be at E3, are going to be at Summer Games Fest, it seems like there are some lines in the sand where some of these companies are trying to compete against one another. But then you have companies like Ubisoft and Xbox and whatnot that are playing to both events. So... Only time will tell, but seeing as we now have a lot more companies involved, that's probably going to make our next predictions video a fair bit longer. We're probably going to have to do them yeah, yeah. together so instead of separately. Like We're not going to do a Summer Games Fest predictions and E3 other games predictions, but we're probably just going to do a uh, video games of the summer, including E3. Yeah, yeah. So the plan uh, as of right now is we're still probably going to do Xbox on its own because they have a fuck ton of stuff that they're, well, yeah. of course, definitely not going to fit all of it in Summer Game Fest as that they will more than likely have their own conference. But everybody else probably going to be included in that. But the, the, the shocker, I think, that the reason why everybody was talking about this was uh, there's one logo in particular that my mouse is hovering over on the screen right now who is shocked to be there, and that is PlayStation. Yeah, so it seemed like PlayStation kind of looked like they were going to probably do their own thing in regards to announcing their video games, kind of like the state of gaming. Yeah, the, the state videos. of gaming. Yeah. yeah, like, I still think they're going to do that. I still I still ultimately... Yeah, it's probably just going to be hosted by the Summer Games Festival like a lot of yeah. these other events are. Yeah, but, um, like, the fact they're going to be like, there... <laughs> They're going to do a mixture of the big day one event where they just reveal an absolute crap ton of stuff. And then they're probably still going to have some spread out announcements from these other companies. I think the main appeal for the Summer Games Fest, even last year when it wasn't as successful mm -hmm. as it could have been, yeah, is these companies could kind of adhere to their own timetables. 
Yeah. When they can announce things literally whenever they want over the period of the summer. Mm -hmm. So we're probably still going to see some announcements from these individual companies, you know, announced individually over the span of a month. Yeah, cause, well, well, okay, more than a month, it seems, because fucking EA over here. Yeah, July 22nd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so overall, this is all very exciting stuff. I'm absolutely looking forward to it, as I'm sure Byron is as well. Yeah, abso- absolutely, and of course, we will be covering this on, on the show. That week is going to be a... Oh my god, these next, like... When we get to that, like, June 10th to, like, 15th week, oh, my God. Yeah, we're probably going to have four or five episodes a week. In, like, how much fucking work? (laughs) Work? (laughs) Well, but it's going to be a ride. And uh, I hope you all join us on on this wacky ride that will be gaming in mid-June 2021. For sure. I think there's a large possibility that that first week of, like, E3 and Summer Games Fest... We're probably gonna have to put out like four episodes for that oh, week. Oh, oh, fucking absolutely! We are. <laughs> I guarantee you that. I get so hope you all are subscribed because get fucking ready. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of content for you guys. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, twenty to thirty games will be brought together. So we will have our predictions for for Summer Game Fest live here in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what shows up. All right. So last bit of news, kind of more of a Debbie Downer bit of news. Not really, though. Jeff Keighley is cautioning everyone to remain cautious coming into this year's Game Fest and not to be overly enthusiastic or optimistic. I think he's just trying to temper expectations overall because I think a lot of people are expecting a lot of big bang announcements of like major games. Like for example, everybody really wanted to see Silk Song this summer, and uh, doesn't look like that's happening. Yeah, um, one of the uh, PR people at uh... oh, at I forgot the name of the company, but yeah, for the Silk Song folks, yeah, they said uh, yeah, no, Team Cherry. Oh, Team, Team Cherry. Cherry, that's the name. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, we. We don't. We aren't gonna be at E3 this year. Yeah, but uh, it, it just seems like overall he's cautioning. He's trying to explain to people that the video game industry has, you know, struggled a lot these past couple of years with COVID and delays and whatnot. So yeah, everybody expecting to see literally every game they want to see are gonna leave disappointed. So. Temper your expectations, everyone. You know, we might be getting, you know, to the finish line in regards to dealing with COVID, but the effects of the pandemic are going to be felt for years and years to come. Oh, absolutely. Since uh, apparently like every two and a half weeks, there's like a new game delay. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Which I'm always for delaying games. It's only when they delay games and then they come out being crap anyway that I'm like mad disappointed, but... As I just finished the damn games, people. <laughs> like, okay, so that's going to be everything for this episode. So uh, this has been Slate. And this has been Byron. And you all have a fantastic morning, evening, and afternoon. That's uh, it, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll see you all next week.